welcome you to the Washington Legal Foundation's web seminar series. This is the last program of the year for us. And for those of you who have tuned in for other programs, we, we welcome you back and, and thank you for, for joining us in the past. For those of you who are with us for the first time, I'll tell you a little bit about the foundation. We're in our 38th year of public interest law policy advocacy and education. We uh, are involved in a wide range of issues of interest to the free enterprise system in both the federal and state courts as a litigator, both original and amicus litigation. Uh, we also maintain a very vigorous and, and I think influential publishing arm, Legal Studies Division, which I'm chief counsel of, um, which puts out publications on a wide range of issues. They're all there on the website that you're on right now. And if you want to spend some time on it after the fact, that would be great. And sort of the third thing that we do is, is communications. In addition to programs such as this, we do media briefings on uh, Supreme Court, lower federal courts, other policy issues. Uh, we maintain a blog called the WLF Legal Pulse that I encourage you to visit as well. And uh, we engage in, in uh, advocacy in other ways such as op-eds and, and uh, direct advertising uh, in uh, newspapers such as the New York Times, The Hill, and others. As reflected by the proliferation of class action lawsuits just as those involving data breaches and labeling of processed foods, private law enforcement is an enduring and growing phenomenon in the United States. Plaintiffs bring many of these actions under federal or state statutes that establish a violation of the statute as the redressable injury. Such laws often provide a financial penalty for each violation. For instance, Netflix settled a Video Privacy Protection Act suit in 2013 involving 62 million subscribers where the potential liability exposure was $150 billion. One question that has arisen in such suits is whether the plaintiffs asserting an injury in law must also establish that they suffered injury in fact and thus have a cognizable case or controversy under Article III of the U.S. Constitution. The answer depends on where the suit is brought, thanks to the fact that there's a pronounced split in the federal circuits on that question. The Supreme Court has been presented with two opportunities in the last three years to resolve this split, but so far has failed to do so. A third opportunity has recently been brought to the court in the form of a case from the Ninth Circuit, Spokio versus Robbins. We have with us today the Council of Record to Spokio, who filed the company's pending petition for review with the Supreme Court as well as the counsel to a credit reporting company that filed an amicus brief to review the, the issues and discuss the case and its larger implications. Uh, if you would like to e email in a question for either of our speakers today, you can do so at interactive at wf.org, and I will present the questions to the speakers. Leading off today is the counsel for Spokio, Andrew Pincus, who is a partner in the Washington, D.C. office of the law firm Mayor Brown. His focus is appellate practice on, on briefing and arguing cases in the Supreme Court and in the federal and state appellate courts. He formerly served as assistant to the Solicitor General of the United States and as general counsel to the Department of Commerce. Mr. Pincus is co-founder and serves as co-director of the Yale Law School's Supreme Court Advocacy Clinic. Following him will be Mayor Fetter, who is a partner in the New York City office of the law firm Jones Day. He heads that office's issues and appeals practice. Prior to joining the firm, Mr. Fetter was a prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York. Andy, if you could get us started. Uh, thanks, Glenn, and, and thanks very much to Glenn and, and WLF for providing this forum on, on uh, what I think is a, a very important case uh, that raises issues that are not only broadly litigated, but really go to the heart of, uh, of the judicial system. Um, let me start by giving some, uh, some background about the case and uh, explaining why uh, we believe that Supreme Court review is, is just critical to uh, resolve the conflict that Glenn mentioned, but also because this issue is, is as I said, being litigated in an enormous amount of lower courts. And just to give one metric of the case's importance, uh, there were 10 amicus briefs filed at the cert stage in support of certiorari, uh, and I've been doing this a long time, as, as Glenn mentioned, and uh, I don't think I've ever had as many uh, different amici want to vigorously advocate in favor of cert. And those briefs represented uh, 17 different entities, some individual companies, and some uh, trade associations. So an enormous, enormous amount of interest uh, in the business community in getting the Supreme Court to take this issue and resolve it. Um, there are a large number of federal statutes, many enacted in recent years, in which Congress has given plaintiffs a choice between recovering actual damages and statutory damages of a fixed amount, uh, often uh, the round sum of $1,000 violation. Uh, just to give a few examples, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the Truth in Lending Act, the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, ERISA, the Video Privacy Protection Act, and about a dozen other statutes. 
Now the reality in today's business environment uh, in which companies interact with tens of thousands or even millions of users of their websites or customers or people to whom they provide information, it's very easy for entrepreneurial plaintiff's lawyers to put together uh, a class action uh, that asserts claims in the tens of millions or even billions or multiple billions of dollars simply by adding up uh, those statutory damages of $1,000 a pop. And when statutory damages are claimed, a class action is a lot easier to put together because the questions of causation and damages calculation that would ordinarily be in a case involving actual injury uh, fall out of the case. The statutory violation is the whole case. So uh, in terms of the requirements of Rule 23, the predominance of common questions in particular, it's a lot easier for plaintiff's lawyers to at least uh, threaten convincingly that they're going to be able to get over that hurdle in a case involving statutory damages. As a result, under these statutes, there's an increasing number of cases in which there's an allegation of a bare statutory violation. No allegation of traditional harm to the plaintiffs or the class members in terms of economic loss or injury to job prospects or the other injuries that would be required to establish the actual injury required by Article 3, or at the minimum, pleading in the alternative. The plaintiff will say, we have these allegations, which we think amount to actual injury, but if they're not good enough, don't worry. We also can claim statutory damages without proving any actual injury. Uh, so the question, uh, really, that this case poses, and these series of cases pose, are can Congress confer, confer standing sufficient to satisfy Article 3 simply by creating a cause of action and a right to recover for the bare statutory violation even when there is not the accompanying injury that ordinarily would be required to get a case into federal court. And this case really provo pro provides the perfect example. So let me talk a little bit about the facts and then zoom out again uh, and talk about where things stand. Uh, Spokio, as I'm sure many of you know, operates a people search engine that aggregates widely available information regarding individuals from phone books, social networks, marketing surveys, real estate listings, other websites, into a searchable online database that's used by many employers and others to get information about job applicants or other individuals with whom they're considering doing business. The plaintiff here, Thomas Robbins, claimed that Spokio violated the Fair Credit Reporting Act by providing uh, erroneous information about him. In particular, his allegation is that the Spokio report overstated his educational background and professional experience and indicated that he was married even though he was not. Uh, Robbins uh, did not allege that he had suffered any concrete harm from these alleged statutory violations. No one who had would, would otherwise have offered him a job didn't. He made some allegations about how these uh, alleged violations might impair his future employment prospects in some undefined way. Uh, the district court, looking at the allegations in the complaint, said uh, those allegations about supposed actual injury or prospective or speculative injury were in fact too speculative to satisfy Article 3 on their own and that the fact of a statutory violation and a claim for statutory damages was not enough to create Article III standing where it didn't exist by virtue of the actual, uh, any actual harm to the individual plaintiff. So in other words, uh, our shorthand is, if there's no injury in fact, there couldn't be injury in law, which is really what these, uh, what these claims are, are asserting. When the case got to the Ninth Circuit, the Ninth Circuit said, we don't even have to address the district court's uh, discussion about uh, whether or not the allegations of speculative harm satisfied Article 3 because we think, in fact, injury in law is sufficient to satisfy Article 3. The bare allegation of a statutory, a statutory violation uh, that, a, that uh, targeting the plaintiff is enough to satisfy Article 3 and get the case into court. Other courts of appeals, uh, as Glenn mentioned, have rejected this injury in law argument uh, the second and fourth circuits in particular. So the issue arises perfectly. Uh, it's important, uh, well posed in this case. We think this is a terrific cert candidate. 
Uh, it's probably not surprising uh, that this is a good cert issue because, as, as Glenn mentioned in his introduction, the Supreme Court actually granted review on this issue a couple of years ago in a case called First American Against Edwards uh, in the 2011 term. Uh, the court granted review after inviting the views of the Solicitor General and having the Solicitor General recommend not taking the case, but the court granted review anyway. Uh, hearing argument, and then uh, at the very end, the last day of that term in June 2012, uh, the court uh, dismissed the writ as improvidently granted, didn't reach the merits. And there was lots of speculation about uh, what might have happened there. Typically, when the court hears a case and decides there's some flaw that prevents it from reaching the question on which it granted review, it will pretty quickly uh, dismiss the writ as improvidently granted, dig, D-I-G, in uh, Supreme Court parlance. Uh, but here, there was quite a several month delay between the two, and so there was some speculation that perhaps the court did at its conference following the argument reach a tentative conclusion, but in the back and forth among members of the court in the argument writing process and the dissent writing process, perhaps uh, there an issue developed uh, that led the justices to believe that this wasn't a good case to uh, address the issue. And let me spend a couple of minutes on why that might have happened, because I think it also is useful for people uh, in understanding why we believe that Spokio uh, doesn't present that kind of problem and in fact will let the court reach the merits. Um, First American involved a claim under the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, RESPA. Um, the claim was uh, that the settlement agent had an exclusive agreement in return for some kind of consideration, maybe a kickback, maybe not, uh, to refer customers to First American for title insurance, and that that arrangement had not been disclosed to the named plaintiff and, of course, to all the other members of the class. Uh, but there was no allegation that the plaintiff had paid any more for title insurance to this person, this company to which uh, they were referred because state law actually set the amount that could be charged for title insurance, and so everybody was going to charge the same thing. So the argument there was there can't be any real injury because there's no excess payment for title insurance, therefore the only basis on which there could be Article III standing is this statutory damages uh, issue, which we also have in Spokio. Um, at the oral argument in First American, however, uh, sort of a different rationale developed, which was that maybe what was going on under RESPA was that Congress had either created or recognized a common law duty relationship between the settlement agent and the uh, customer, and that the claim that was being asserted was akin to a breach of fiduciary duty or breach of other type of uh, special duty claim at common law for which uh, plaintiffs at common law did not have to show actual injury other than the actual breach of the fiduciary duty. So it's possible, at least the argument was being spun out in the oral argument in First American, uh, that the uh, claim there could have satisfied traditional Article III standing requirements because of this fiduciary duty element. Um, at least that was some thought in the post-First American speculation. Here, uh, there's no possibility of that kind of claim because obviously there was no relationship of any kind between uh, Spokio and Mr. Robbins. He wasn't a customer, he had no financial relationship, nothing of the kind. So there's no way that any uh, Article III standing argument here could be premised on this kind of uh, fiduciary duty type arrangement. So something we obviously have emphasized in the cert petition and believe that that means the issue is very cleanly presented here. So what does the plaintiff argue to try and defeat review? Most of the brief in opposition really spends its time arguing that the court has no reason to reach uh, the injury in law argument because there's plenty of injury in fact. They say the lower courts got it wrong. There was plenty uh, of allegations sufficient to satisfy the traditional Article III injury test. Of course, the problem there is A, the district court found the opposite, B, the Ninth Circuit didn't even address the question. And so even if that were true, that would be an issue that the plaintiffs could argue on remand, but it's not an issue sufficient to defeat the Supreme Court's review of the issue actually decided by the Ninth Circuit. Um, probably building on First American, the plaintiffs make another argument, which is to say, oh, we allege reputational injury here that's just like the kind of injury that's sufficient to allow 
claims of defamation per se to proceed at common law. Therefore, even though there's no actual injury, uh, we fit within this common law box of defamation per se. Again, the problem is not an argument that the lower courts even addressed, but also it's not an argument that doesn't work. The Supreme Court and other courts have been very specific that defamation per se, in other words, defamation claims that can proceed without proof of actual harm are a very, very narrow category of claims. Uh, hatred, contempt, or ridicule, and probably saying someone is more, uh, more uh, has greater qualifications and is married may not fall within the hatred, contempt, or ridicule category. Maybe, but probably not, at least. I'm not gonna say that because I am married. Um, the plaintiffs also say there's no conflict. They say you can't point to another Fair Credit Reporting Act case in another circuit that holds that injury in law is not sufficient. And uh, that's true, but irrelevant, because what courts have done is to address this issue generally, uh, not in a statutory specific way. So in the Ninth Circuit uh, case itself, what the Ninth Circuit held in applying its injury in law is enough argument to the Fair Credit Reporting Act was to rely on its decisions under another statute, as other courts have as well. So that argument really doesn't make any sense. We know perfectly well that if this case arose in the fourth or the second circuit, they would apply those precedents uh, to say injury in law is not enough. And of course, because plaintiff's lawyers are very smart, it's not likely that's going to happen because for the most part, these are nationwide class actions that generally can be brought in places where there's either no law or favorable law. And so not a lot of interest in the plaintiff's part in creating a, a square conflict on the FCRA issue when they know they can bring the case in the Ninth Circuit, for example, and take advantage of favorable Ninth Circuit precedent. Uh, finally, let me say a word about the status of the case. Um, the court, uh, as everyone listening here knows, because they're experienced in observing the Supreme Court, the court can grant a cert petition, it can deny a cert petition, or it can take option three and ask the Solicitor General to file an amicus brief expressing the views of the United States on whether or not cert should be granted. Um, it took that third option in this case, as it had done in First American, and asked uh, the SG for his views. Uh, now, we know uh, from the SG's brief in First American that the SG uh, takes the position that injury in law does satisfy Article Three. So we can be pretty confident, I think, that on the merits, the US government is not going to be a friend to uh, the position that we assert in the cert petition. We're hopeful, however, that on the other question, which is whether cert should be granted, uh, the SG will recognize that since it filed, since the brief in First American was filed, uh, the court granted review, which indicated that the court certainly thought that this issue warranted review, uh, even though it couldn't reach it. And so we're hopeful that at least the SG will file a brief uh, saying that search should be granted, even though arguing that on the merits uh, the injury in law position should be sustained. Uh, we'll see. Those briefs uh, typically take a while to come out, although again, we're hopeful that because in this case, the government has had a chance to think a lot about the legal issues in the context of First American, there's some possibility uh, that the brief will be filed either this month or early next month so that the court could act on it in time for the petition to be heard uh, before the end of the arguments this term, but stay tuned, uh, hard to tell. Uh, let me stop there and, uh, and pass the baton to Mary. Thanks. I want to talk a little bit more about uh, why this is such a pressing problem and uh, why it's particularly appropriate for the court to address it uh, in the context of the FCRA, uh, notwithstanding uh, the argument by the respondents in this case uh, that, as Andy pointed out, really makes no sense here that there is no specific FCRA, uh, FCRA case on the other side in one of the other circuits because the proposition of law is one as to which there is a very clear split and I don't think they uh, are able to, to rebut that. Uh, but in fact, the FCRA is a particularly good setting for this uh, and I wanna focus in particular on why the class action setting of so many of these FCRA uh, no injury statutory damages cases uh, is relevant here. Uh, 
because these FCRA class actions, and there are uh, an awful lot of them, I think uh, it's probably uh, almost certainly by this point over 100 filed in 2014. I don't have the, uh, the latest figures. And these are not class actions uh, where numerosity is in question. You're talking about class actions that uh, can involve millions of consumers and potentially billions in damages. So, and that actually is the first and I guess most obvious reason why uh, the class action setting uh, uh, for so many of these cases makes it important uh, for this issue to be taken up by the court. Uh, and that's just simply the size and importance of the cases because the FCRA deals with consumer credit reports. Uh, as you can imagine, there are a lot of consumers in the United States, there are an incredible number millions, hundreds of millions of consumer credit files, and so the cases uh, very often involve millions of uh, class members or putative class members because uh, the plaintiff's lawyers will identify a practice to be challenged under the FCRA that is one that uh, will affect uh, those millions or uh, tens of millions of, of consumers at once. Uh, and uh, because the FCRA provides for statutory damages of uh, $100 to $1,000 uh, under the statute, uh, it's, because it's in tens, it's easy to multiply. You really can be talking about uh, billions of damages. Is one case in our amicus brief uh, that uh, involved a claim for actually trillions uh, in, in damages under uh, a similar statute. And I think that the size of these cases and the frequency is one reason that we have this extraordinary outpouring of amicus uh, support for a grant here. There are uh, 10 briefs uh, uh, representing 17 different entities because uh, these lawsuits are, first of all, a huge problem for uh, a critical industry. That industry is uh, credit reporting and related things and credit reporting for reasons that probably are obvious but, sh but which in any event I won't bore people with is critical to uh, uh, what makes credit easily available in the United States. You uh, need a well-functioning uh, reporting system uh, in order for people to know that they can trust the consumers they're lending to. And uh, that system obviously costs money and lawsuits make it cost more money uh, and uh, things, uh, uh, any threat of gumming up the works there is uh, interfering with something that's critical to the economy and so uh, we do have uh, all of these amicus briefs uh, being filed, and I'll touch on, on uh, some of those in, in particular a little bit later. But I want to get to another aspect of the class action setting that I think really uh, uh, helps to illustrate why uh, this is an issue that uh, the court should be taking seriously. And that's because uh, the class action context really uh, illustrates what an extraordinary divergence there has been from the Article III model of what federal courts exist for, what they're supposed to be doing, or for that matter, what they are limited to doing. Article III uh, and the, the concrete injury, actual injury requirement of Article III is part of the case or controversy idea that the federal courts are uh, limited to deciding uh, real disputes between uh, real aggrieved parties, uh, something that would have been recognizable as uh, a case back in 1789. And uh, in these statutory damages class actions, not only do you have, as in uh, this Spokio case, as Andy describes, uh, a situation where you have happened, happened to have a plaintiff with uh, who hasn't suffered an injury. Uh, in fact, the absence of injury is really essential 
to the class actions. It's not a bug, it's a feature from the standpoint of a plaintiff's class action lawyer. And the reason for that is pretty simple. If you have people who are really injured by the claim violation and have actually suffered some sort of damages, those damages will be individual. They are going to prevent you from certifying a class. You are not going to be able to hold the threat of $40 billion in liability or whatever the case may be over the head of the defendant to uh, extort a settlement. And so uh, if you have injury, you don't have a class, you don't have uh, the large lawsuit, and uh, you know, not coincidentally, you don't have the uh, same size of attorney's fees involved in uh, the litigation. If, on the other hand, you can find a case where you have essentially an abstract violation where no one is harmed, then, uh, as uh, many courts have now accepted, uh, the plaintiffs can waive actual damages on behalf of the class uh, and pursue only a statutory damages remedy. Uh, there's a case in particular I'm thinking of by Judge Easterbrook that was one of the first to say that that was uh, something that uh, plaintiffs were able to do. And so uh, the no injury aspect here is what produces uh, the uh, uh, large class sizes that keep this particular corner of the litigation industry going. Uh, so you now have basically the exact opposite of what Article Three contemplates. You have instead of uh, the courts needing to be brought in to uh, resolve a dispute where uh, there are real aggrieved parties, in fact you have them brought in precisely because no one has actually uh, been injured and therefore you can have uh, essentially an abstract litigation on behalf of absent class members uh, for statutory damages. Let me give you two examples uh, from my personal experience, uh, both of them on behalf of Experian, which is uh, one of uh, the three major national credit reporting agencies. Uh, sometimes, often, as in the first example I mentioned, they're sued together with uh, TransUnion and Equifax, the two other uh, credit reporting agencies. And this is a case uh, that was uh, in federal district court on the theory that, uh, and listen carefully because you may be hard to see what the wrong is, but uh, I'm sure that uh, if you listen carefully enough, you'll appreciate it. The claim was that uh, the credit reporting agencies had violated the FCRA uh, because in their credit reports uh, for consumers that had Capital One credit cards, and you can appreciate that's a lot of consumers. I think the class was, uh, they were seeking to represent four million uh, class members, something along those lines. Uh, the credit reporting agencies were not reporting the credit card limits for uh, the people with Capital One credit cards. So not an actual inaccuracy in any way, but just that information was not reported. Now, that may not seem like the worst thing in the world to some of you listening, but uh, perhaps you could see that, you know, well, why aren't they reporting it? They weren't reporting it because Capital One uh, was not willing to provide the information to credit reporting agencies. So uh, the lawsuit uh, was on the theory that they had to report this information that they didn't have. Um, and, you know, perhaps this would be an occasion for uh, a different uh, uh, forum on, uh, you know, some of the other glories of the litigation system as to why a claim like that is able to go forward, but uh, uh, there, uh, the claim did survive uh, not only a motion to dismiss, but summary judgment, and a class was certified. And the theory of injury, because one of the arguments that the defendants made there was that 
the class members were not injured, uh, or at least some of them were not injured, and uh, uh, the court uh, you know, needed to address that under Article Three. The theory of injury was that not having uh, a credit card limit affects your credit score because of complicated things having to do with the credit scoring algorithm. And the only thing is that how it affects your credit score uh, is far from certain and it's gonna depend on all kinds of things like how many credit card accounts you have, what the limits are on the others, uh, several other things. And so it may lower your credit score but, or it may raise your credit score. Uh, and really no way of knowing that in the abstract, and the class included, of course, both people whose scores would have gone up, people whose scores would have gone down. So uh, you have a class certified there, not only uh, including uh, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, uh, class members who were not injured, but actually were affirmatively benefited by the claimed violation. Uh, the district court certified that uh, eventually uh, a later summary judgment motion succeeded, so there, we did not get to present that to the Court of Appeals. And of course, if it had not been decided on summary judgment, it still probably would not have made it to the Fourth Circuit because uh, this is before the, the current good Fourth Circuit authority that, uh, uh, that Andy mentioned. Uh, this wouldn't have made it up there because how are companies going to go to trial facing liability of anywhere uh, from, I think it was, the range was $400 million to $4 billion. Uh, it takes a lot of confidence in, uh, you know, your opinion of, of the law to, uh, to be able to do that. So, and of course, under the Ninth Circuit decision uh, in this case, uh, there wouldn't have been a problem with that. And I certainly don't see any reason why in future cases uh, plaintiffs would not be able to bring any similar case in the Ninth Circuit to take advantage of Ninth Circuit law uh, because these are uh, typically nationwide practices under federal law. Uh, there's rarely something state specific about them. So, uh, you know, a smart plaintiff lawyer can prevent uh, the, uh, the split from arising or deepening because you go where, where the law is established. The second example is a recent example uh, in a case called Dreher, uh, where here we have a class going forward even after uh, the district court uh, found that no one was actually going to suffer any injury. Uh, and uh, he said this on the record, but nonetheless uh, certified the class. Uh, and again, we're talking about, as you often are, with uh, a statute, a regulatory statute like the FCRA or many of the others that uh, have statutory damages. Uh, you're talking about a fairly technical violation. Uh, in this case, the violation is that uh, you have credit card holders with credit cards issued by Advanta Bank, which uh, went into FDIC receivership. And so in, instead of functioning themselves, there's a credit card servicer called Cardworks that was handling the accounts uh, for people to reporting on the credit data, for people to pay off their accounts and, and so forth. And dealing with people, by the way, under the name Advanta, because that's, you know, it's like outsourcing uh, of something, just as an outsourced call center will answer the phone with the name of the company. So they're corresponding with people basically acting under, under the name Advanta. Uh, and the violation here is that on consumer disclosures under one of the provisions uh, of the FCRA, you have to identify the source of the information on the credit report. Uh, and uh, here the source was identified as Advanta, 
so that when people got their credit disclosure, they would recognize, uh, and actually the FDIC had asked that it be reported that way, and you want people to recognize uh, what account they're talking about. If any uh, of you have gotten your own credit report, you know that you might look at something and see a name and wonder what credit account you have by that name. Uh, presumably, if you saw card works, you would not know what it related to. If you were, had an Advanta card, you would know Advanta was, was, was that card. So this was the willful violation of the FCRA at issue there, uh, another claim that was not uh, uh, disposed of easily. Quite the contrary, it's, it's uh, still going forward. And uh, the theory of injury there uh, is, uh, I guess, fair to say, uh, uh, abstract as well. It's, uh, I think the, the district court phrased it as an informational injury, deciding that under the FCRA, uh, you have to report this, the source of this information using the corporate name Cardworks and not the name they were operating under Advanta, I mean, we really are not that far away here from talking about something saying that you have to spell things correctly and the consumer is deprived of uh, uh, proper spelling if uh, it's misspelled. And you can, you know, I, I don't mean to overly make light of it, but I mean, just to make the point that these are some really, uh, we're not talking about uh, uh, exactly uh, outrageous conduct being perpetrated on uh, the members of the class. You're talking about information that uh, probably well over 99% of them have no interest in the difference between saying Advanta and saying card works. And this is another one of the points about the class action context. It's one thing to talk about informational injury if someone is entitled to a particular type of information and an individual plaintiff is suing to get that information or over being denied the information when you're talking about absent class members uh, and there's no reason to think that anyone is affected one way or the other by the presence or absence of particular information. You really are talking about uh, uh, and uh, extreme departure from the model that uh, Article Three contemplates. So, you know, those are those are two examples. There are unfortunately uh, plenty of others, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, among other things, I don't think that Congress was contemplating class action enforcement of these particular statutory damages mechanisms. Uh, there's actually an attorney's fees provision in the FCRA to, uh, for successful claims to, because the idea is people need some basis to be able to bring these claims individually. You wouldn't need that if you were thinking about class actions, but uh, the fact is that the statutory requirements are there, the violation produces uh, class actions, and this is uh, the situation that we have, and it's one that really is, uh, you know, its own, uh, you know, mini industry that uh, presents threats of large damages, uh, uh, puts the federal courts in the position of adjudicating claims on behalf of millions and tens of millions of uh, class members who have not been injured in any way. And that brings me to, you know, just briefly touching on who the amici are that, uh, you know, we're not talking just about the theoretical problem here. There is a real, uh, uh, you know, assortment of amicus briefs here. Uh, you have not only uh, people involved in the credit reporting industry, which as I say is an important industry, and that's um, my client Experian, TransUnion, uh, one of the other credit reporting agencies. Uh, 
there is an association of credit and collection professionals, uh, association of professional background screeners, uh, National Consumer Reporting Association, there's a trade industry group, the Consumer Data Industry Association, all of those uh, entities are obviously very concerned about that specifically in the FCRA context. Uh, you have the Chamber of Commerce, which as many of you know, will weigh in on issues that are truly important uh, to the national business community and, and has weighed in here. Uh, one thing that's very interesting is there is a brief on behalf of Google, Facebook, Yahoo, and eBay, uh, and that brief uh, points out uh, very effectively and importantly that there are not just the FCRA, but uh, a whole slew of statutes that are similar, and uh, this is something that, that really is, uh, you know, of, of importance not just to one corner of the business world, but really to the information industry. Uh, and uh, there is, as well, there are uh, a number of nonprofit legal foundations, uh, Pacific Legal Foundation, New England Legal Foundation, uh, DRI, the voice of the defense bar. I guess I'm old enough to remember when they were the Defense Research Institute, but uh, uh, in any event, uh, as Andy said, it's really uh, an extraordinary message about the importance of this issue, which uh, at some level may seem very abstract, uh, and yet, uh, you know, we are talking here uh, for the reasons that we've talked about, about a major subversion of uh, the traditional Article Three role of the federal court. Well, there are some there are some cases where, in passing, the court has has referenced the idea that statutes could uh, create the right to get into court, and the plaintiffs here and in other cases basically take that quote from that basically one case out of context and blow it up. But it wasn't really a case where the court was squarely addressing this issue, as the Grant and First American showed, because that was the same argument that was made against cert in First American. So I think probably because it really wasn't focused on this issue, which has really come to the fore in the, in the years since that loose language was there, uh, I think that's why there really is a need for the court itself to step in, because as you say, part of the conflict is rests on something that the, the, the lower courts believe, or at least some lower courts believe the Supreme Court said, so the only way to fix that is for the Supreme Court itself to, to step in and, and address the issue. In, in the brief that you had, had authored for uh, Experian Mayor, you had sort of spun out a little bit of an argument where standing is seen as sort of a non-delegation doctrine of uh, sorts, where the limitation on the ability of private actors to enforce the laws um, was one of the goals of the founders when they um, adopted the case and controversy requirement of, of Article Three. Can you explain that sort of perspective a little bit? Sure, and, and it ties into what I was saying earlier, which is that uh, you really end up with a, a system where uh, you have, I think, unwittingly created incentives for uh, private lawyers to uh, appoint themselves as private attorneys general with uh, very large uh, potential financial payoffs and what gets you the payoff is identifying abstract violations of uh, often technical statutes that don't actually injure anybody. And you have really something uh, that, you know, I, I talked before, I think I may have used this, some phrasing about turning Article 3 on its head. Uh, but uh, the concept of prosecutorial discretion that you have 
when you have government enforcement, you have the exact opposite here. Uh, normally, when you have a, a democratically responsible executive branch making decisions about what, what, what and where to enforce, uh, one factor that will be important is whether people are actually harmed by what can be claimed to be a technical violation of a statute. Here, that's a consideration too, except it cuts in exactly the opposite way, where if you can find the thing that harms nobody, then you have a potential class action because there are no messy individual damages to prevent class treatment. And so not only do you not have the normal executive check on over enforcement of the law, you actually have an affirmative incentive to over enforce the law precisely where enforcement would be most inappropriate. I guess that, that's one thing to, to see if you would, would stress is that sometimes in these situations, plaintiff's lawyers would argue that if these cases aren't allowed to go forward as class actions, then the harm is going to go unpunished. However, these laws were written in such a way to, infor to empower federal and state agencies to enforce the law. Is that, that the case in, in almost all of these laws? Well, the FCRA in particular has provisions for uh, Federal Trade Commission enforcement. Uh, and I would couple that with the, you know, I hope not controversial proposition that the Republic might survive capital on credit limits not being reported when they're not provided. Any thoughts on that, Andrew? Yeah, I, I mean, I do think... Uh, you know, WLF has, has done a lot of work on this whole question about the class action device and how it has skewed so much of what's happened in our in our legal system in recent years because it creates these, uh, it was sort of plopped in without recognizing the very different incentives and lack of controls that exist when you have uh, claims that don't have any real client in control of the cause of action. They're really just lawyer created and driven. Um, and that also uh, have the real difference in incentives often between the lawyers and the class members. I mean, here, that sort of, it takes it to a new level. You have class members that aren't really harmed at all. As Mayor said, that's sort of the requirement is to find an injury that doesn't, uh, a, an alleged violation that doesn't really harm anyone. Uh, and then to sort of press it as much as you can in order to generate uh, a claim that will hopefully, in the plaintiff's lawyer's view, lead to a settlement. Uh, and, and often, frankly, the other piece, which really doesn't come to the fore in this case, but is a feature of class actions, a settlement in which the class members are almost certainly not going to get much of anything because the settlement will be so little for so many people that, as we know, the percentages of people that actually uh, pick up or file the, the claim necessary to get money in consumer class actions is infinitesimal. It's really small when the amount to be gained is little. And so what ends up happening in many of these cases is there's some CPRE award to a charity, you know, picked by the lawyers and the judge. And so you have the legal system really doing nothing for the people in whose name the case, the case was persecuted, focused on some trivial or not, not impactful, at least, alleged violation, um, but that does generate lots of money for lawyers. And, you know, defense lawyers obviously have to, have to be paid too. And so if you look at the economic, the systemic effects of this phenomenon, it's really just sucking money out of the system in a way that doesn't really benefit anyone except to uh, impose lots of additional costs on companies that are trying to provide either services that are essential to, to the availability of credit in the economy and making that more expensive, or to, as Mayor said, you know, companies that are among the most innovative in our economy. And that, that just seems like a, it's a totally crazy situation. I think, actually, let me just add one, one thought to that. I mean, I don't want to be taken as, you know, taking a blanket negative attitude to the idea of uh, private attorney general, excuse me, attorneys general, uh, or uh, plaintiff class action lawyers generally, because there are plenty of contexts where uh, 
those things can serve a useful role. The antitrust laws for a long time have had a private attorney general model. And, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, while there can be excesses, certainly, generally, I think the feeling is that the antitrust laws have uh, been uh, a benefit uh, for the uh, economy and, and, and for the legal system. And, uh, you know, securities is an example where Congress has actually taken action to try to align the incentives better so that people or usually uh, often state pension funds with real money at stake are making the decisions as the plaintiffs. And so, you know, I, I don't want to be saying at all that this is some sort of blanket uh, a, a attack on, uh, uh, you know, what can be uh, a, a large part of the litigation system and, and, and in, in some cases beneficial, but the key here is that this is precisely an area that's been carved out where you are looking to create a very large volume of litigation at very high stakes uh, on behalf of an awful lot of people precisely because no one has been harmed. Remind you, if you have any questions, email us at interactive at WLF.org. Um, one thing that I think is notable in these contexts is that you don't, for instance, see the FDA filing amicus briefs in cases involving food labeling class actions, or you don't see, as you said, that the SG is likely to weigh in uh, on the side of the plaintiff's lawyers in this one favoring uh, a sort of looser standing requirement. In normal situations, federal agencies are very, and state agencies are very protective of their turf and their enforcement authority. What's the, do you think, the explanation for why they're, they're more likely to be in favor of more vigorous private law enforcement, such as with the FCRA and other laws in this instance? Well, I think part of it is a, uh, a not a, partisan political overlay, but it's a, there's a, there are policy differences uh, amongst administrations uh, in terms of how much private and what the rules are in particular governing private enforcement. You know, you certainly saw in the Bush administration, the SG filing some, not in every case, but in some cases filing briefs saying, gee, we're worried here that this position goes too far in terms of private enforcement. I think, you know, the current administration has a, has a, a policy perspective that's much more favorably inclined to, to private enforcement. I mean, I, I do think, uh, you know, there's just a, a question about our, our economy. We, we just created a gigantic new agency that has the power to, inf in the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, that has the power along with the FTC to enforce these very laws and has, because Congress was concerned about its independence, a guaranteed 600 million plus per year budget not subject to the appropriations process. So a lot of the arguments about the need for sort of untrammeled private enforcement, uh, whatever their merit may be in other contexts, as, as Mayor said, in this particular context, uh, you do have this injection of a huge new private enforcer uh, that also has the power with respect to a lot of the businesses that actually are subject to the FCRA to do uh, supervisory inspections of them. And so you wonder whether in this context, uh, you know, what the rationale could be of not just saying we're going to have private enforcement for people who are really injured or classes of them, but for people who aren't injured. It just seems as if we, we sort of, people who have a policy perspective sort of follow it down to its logical conclusion without stepping back and saying, you know, we are an economy that, that competes in a world where uh, other countries don't necessarily believe that, you know, multiple layers of law enforcement and multiple layers of private litigation on top of that are the most sensible allocation of resources, but, but we've sort of not been willing to have in, a, in an organized way, the conversation that steps back and says, what's a rational way to do this? I mean, this case presents a little snapshot of maybe a, a, the ability within the, the legal doctrines that are played to, to take that step, at least. And I think maybe Andy can speak to this better than I can. It's also possible that, you know, the, I mean, because what we're talking about here, uh, 
given the way the SCRA has been interpreted, and uh, I don't think it's inevitable that it had to be interpreted to allow uh, these actions with no injury at all, but given that it's been interpreted that way, you're then talking about declaring an act of Congress unconstitutional, and so uh, all things being equal, I think the SG is going to feel obligated on the merits, at least, to defend the constitutionality of an act of Congress, however unintended I may happen to think this situation was when Congress passed the law. So that, that Although it being that, I was just going to say, we actually have had this discussion a little bit, and I, I, I do think, although you can frame this as declaring the, an act of Congress unconstitutional, if you are maybe... The, the plaintiffs, are, I think, certainly see it that way. But there certainly are many situations in which the court has held that various people don't have standing under statutorily created causes of action where it's not declaring the cause of action unconstitutional. I'm thinking of citizen supervisions and other things. Uh, it just says it doesn't extend this wide. I mean, you can think of that in terms of the environmental laws where the court has sometimes said, you know, you don't have standing. It's true there's a statutory cause of action, but just saying that this group of people can't invoke it, you know, doesn't necessarily say it's unconstitutional. So I think there's something to that because even the statutory damages element, you know, there are, it would be a rational world to say statutory damages are available for people who have actual injury, but an actual injury that's not easily quantifiable. And therefore, the actual injury gets them into court, but there's a sort of a minimum recovery, even if you can't prove up, as there is in copyright in other areas, uh, the sort of if you can't quantify that injury sufficiently, we're going to make sure there's a minimum. And that seems to me a perfectly plausible way to interpret the statute uh, that would be consistent with the Constitution and not require anything to be struck down. That's kind of what arose in the Defenders of Wildlife <clears throat> versus Lujan case some years ago. Chief Justice Roberts, when he was in private practice, wrote a law review article advancing that sort of a, of a point that Article Three exists as a check on the, the judiciary's power and, and authority and how many things they should be getting involved in. Um, but in that situation, there was a citizen supervision under the Endangered Species Act, I think it was, and, and the court found that the, the Defense of Wildlife didn't have standing, but that did, they didn't strike down the law as unconstitutional. That certainly avoided you know, that kind of situation. Um, in the discussion earlier, you had mentioned that the Edwards case was seen by the court likely as, as an imperfect vehicle to bring this issue to the fore because of the possibility of a fiduciary duty. Do you, if, if the court does grant certain spokio, how do you think the court's gonna, gonna address that concern that in some situations there might be an underlying financial transaction and, and there might be situations where they're standing. Do you see a limited opinion coming out of something like this or, or how sweeping do you think they might be able to, to rule here? Well, I, I think they'll obviously address the, the particular, I assume they'll say some general things about whatever the standing principle is they end up adopting and then uh, apply it here. And in this context, obviously, it's, it's relatively easy because, as I said, there isn't a commercial relationship. Uh, and, and in the FCRA context, there, uh, although there could be, uh, in many, many, many situations there isn't uh, because typically these massive class actions, as Mayor said, are being brought against credit reporting agencies and others in the system who, with whom the consumers don't have any relationship. Uh, and so I, I think this is a good context in which the court can address it. I, I think my guess is that that the court will be careful to say, you know, we're addressing, we're talking generally about this idea and we're going to apply it here, but there may be uh, contexts in which an actual injury requirement is satisfied. I mean, there are, there are sort of three gradations of ways of thinking about the legal issue. Uh, one is traditional actual injury. Is there something that if this were a common law cause of action would be, that would be sufficient? And then I think the government, uh, espouses the view that, that at the minimum, or at least one of its arguments, is that Congress can define or clarify areas in which injury was it, perhaps not as clear at common law, but as clear now. And so the first American argument would have been a variety of that. There probably, almost certainly, 
at common law, I don't think that settlement agents had a fiduciary duty necessarily to their customers. Uh, but you could sort of see an analogy there that the statute is building on in a way that is sort of a middle ground. And then you can see things like this case where there's sort of hard to imagine any uh, real analogy between um, anything that existed at common law and is here. You know, I think the, most, the best that could be done, as I said, would be to some uh, analogy to defamation. And, you know, some people have suggested that perhaps uh, the Congress along the line of this middle ground could say, well, if falsity of the information is an element of the statutory claim, then maybe Congress could say, uh, maybe you could have a legal rule that said, well, it's true that at common law this wasn't something that would fit within defamation per se, but it's close enough and the falsity element is there, so Congress has a little bit of elasticity. Uh, you know, the, in this case, however, uh, I, I think there are six claims. Five, uh, for all but one of the claims, it's perfectly clear that falsity is not an element. And my guess is that the government, in, because it wants the claims to be expansive, will take the position that falsity isn't an element for the sixth. So that argument is, a, is not going to be available. Do you see the rationale of the court if they do decide to take this case extending to state consumer protection laws and other laws at the state level similar to the FCRA where um, you have an injury and law situation where the standing is created by the, a violation of the statute itself rather than having to prove actual harm? Uh, yeah, well, certainly in, in to the extent those claims are brought in federal court or in states that have in, the, in either in their constitution, state constitution or, or other, uh, or state law, a, uh, a similar actual injury requirement on the scope of the courts. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, uh, you know, actions that are brought in state courts are gonna depend on what that state's law of standing is. And, uh, but as to, uh, state statutes brought in federal court, you know, the, the, the principles uh, should apply in the same way. And, you know, again, it will depend on the nature of the right and the violation at issue. Uh, there are certainly plenty of things under state uh, consumer protection statutes that do involve injury. Uh, I think that, you know, what we're talking about here is this sort of burgeoning area of uh, you know, technical violations that don't result in injury. And, you know, it's actually interesting. The FCRA's phrasing in creating the uh, statutory damages remedy is almost as if it's trying to tee up this issue <laughs> uh, because the phrasing is about a, you know, I don't remember if the word is violation or what it is, but it's basically a violation with respect to particular consumer. It's not someone injured by, not someone aggrieved by, it's if you have violated some requirement of the statute with respect to somebody, we're awarding them uh, this right to sue. Uh, one last question. The, the court yesterday denied review in a case that WF filed an amicus brief in support of the BP case where there was some aspects of that where you had BP, BP, BP was alleging that there were uninjured class members in, in the class and that therefore uh, you couldn't have a, a certified class with non-injured members. The court didn't grant cert in that one. Does that send any messages to either of you in terms of what they may do in Spokio? I don't think so. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of the arguments against review in that case, and I'm not saying they were meritorious, but a lot of the arguments were that were against review in that case had to do with the fact that there was an agreement at issue, and a lot of the arguments had to do with whether the agreement was being properly interpreted or not, as opposed to a situation where you have some statutorily uh, prescribed standard and, and how that's being applied. And, you know, at least the ops, the briefs in opposition certainly seemed to think that that was a, a way to distinguish that case from uh, from the other cases. I mean, there certainly have been wholly separate from the, the issue that's in Spokio, this question about class actions and whether they can encompass non-injured people, which is a sort of a related but different species of which uh, the Whirlpool washer cases were part and, and BP was again with this settlement wrinkle apart. And, and my guess is at some point, 
the court will address address that issue because it, it really is a it creates some other problems, uh, not the least of which is if the class is defined to include those people, then to the extent there are actually injured people in the class, their recovery is going to be diluted by being shared amongst this group of people that includes some non-injured people. And so it raises some very interesting, although different, questions. I want to thank you both for joining us today and, and everyone who joined us online. Um, if you joined us late or you know of someone who might want to uh, view the program, it will be up as an archived file on our website later this afternoon. Uh, once again, thanks for joining us and happy holidays, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.